All right, it's oh. connecting now. Go. <laughs> Let's go. Welcome to the Sacramento Storytelling Guild June Swap. And the theme is, oh, the places you'll go, the people you'll meet. And I came up with this idea as host, and I'm Linda Kennedy, by the way, for those of you who don't know me. Um, I came up with this idea that keeping with the theme, that instead of doing our traditional introductions, and many of us have heard the introductions many times over, over the several years, that instead you would answer two questions. The first one, where would you like to go and why? And the second one, who would you like to meet and why? So our first teller tonight will be Andy. And Andy said that he would like to go to the Grand Canyon. And I loved his answer, why? Because he'd never been there before. <laughs> Very practical answer. Yeah. And then who would he like to meet? He said he would be at the Grand Canyon and he would like to meet Louis L'Amour there so he could give him some great tents, tents, hints at, <laughs> at creating landscapes. Well, you know, Andy is already a published author mm -hmm. and he is also a great Louis, R um, what's the name, L'Amour, I wanna get that right, um, fan. And I just learned that he has in his home a collection of leather bound Louis L'Amour books. Way to go. So Andy, thank you for those questions. And he is gonna tell us a story tonight, a heartfelt story to honor Father's Day. Let's welcome Andy. Thank you, Linda, very much. I'm going to remove your spotlight for just a second here. Um, bear with me. And okay, now it's all on me. <laughs> Thank you everybody for letting me tell you a story tonight. The title of my story is Final Goodbyes and it's to honor my dad and my stepdad. Those are the two most important men in my lives. My dad was a traditional father, a traditional husband. He, he did a great job providing for his family and that's no small feat considering I'm the youngest of six kids. He, um, he was a man's man, you know, his, his career was in construction and he had a rather um, narrow view of the world, but he taught me everything he could the best he could. He taught me how to catch and throw a ball. He taught me how to build a doghouse. He taught me how to go camping and fishing and hunting, how to build a campfire. You know, he taught me how to work too. And he taught me never put my hands in my pockets when I'm on the job. And he also taught me to never, most importantly, raise a hand to a woman, no matter what. I got along well with my dad and I loved him and respected him. I respected him for everything he accomplished in life. He was 40 years old. When he passed, I was 40 years old when he passed on. The last three months of his life were really hard. He had open heart surgery and he was struggling to survive. This was up in Oregon and I was living down here in Sacramento, so I would visit him every weekend. And we would make small talk and talk about just anything and everything, including my infant son. He got to meet my son before he got, became ill, which was really great. But, you know, he was really upset in the hospital. Tom Gunny, he said, I, I had it all planned out. I was going to take him boating and fishing and hunting and I was going to do all that stuff with him. And he was really, really bummed out about it. You know, and I guess he probably knew at that time that he wasn't going to make it out of the hospital, but I didn't connect the dots. The next time I saw him, you know, it was the same type of thing. And I told him, dad, keep your chin up, keep fighting. You know, he was a tough guy. Keep fighting dad. And he shook his head. He goes, you know, Andy, I don't think I'm going to make it out of here. Well, it was time to say goodbye. I said, well, Dad, I love you, and um, I'll see you later. And he, he looked over the top of his glasses like this, and he says, you look good, Andy. Well, those were the last words he ever said to me. The next time I saw him, he was unconscious, and I watched him take his last breath. My stepfather, Kent, was the antithesis of my father. He was formally educated. He was a realtor and big finance big finance guy. His, his world was open and wide open and he taught me to have an appreciation for education. He taught me to appreciate diverse perspectives and opinions. He knew that my dad wanted me to follow in his footsteps in construction, but I didn't want that. So he taught me to check different avenues to pick a career that was right for me. He was kind and considerate 
in his guidance with me. And he, it was so important to me at that time because that's what I needed in my emotional development, with my emotional development at that time. He and my mom taught me how to respect where I came from and to aspire for success in a career that I chose. Kent died from cancer. He died in the comfort of his home with my mom and my sisters at his side. A couple of weeks before that, I went to visit him and I sat on his bed. He was in hospice. And I told him what he meant to me and how, how I felt about him. And I told him that I loved him. At that, he began to weep. And he said he loved me too. And he loved my mom and my sisters. And he was so grateful that he met my mom and, and he could come become part of the family. You know, I, I was just, you know, we, he and I had never had a talk like that before. And I'm just so glad I got to say that before he died. So many people don't have that opportunity. And maybe it's a blessing in disguise. I don't know. But for me, it was an opportunity for cherished memories for both of them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Thank you for reminding us that different people who are very close in our lives and just so different they are, make you who you are. That was a beautiful remembrance. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, our next teller is Karen Daly. And Karen, when I asked her where she would like to go, like my book, so I can read. Karen said that she would like to go to Sweden, especially Stockholm, where her maternal grandfather had come from. And in 2022, next year with her brother, she is going to the Azores, Portugal, to visit the islands where her paternal grandparents originated. That sounds like a great trip you're planning. And who would she like to meet? Well, she said she would like to meet Abraham Lincoln, just to pick his brain regarding today's political atmospheres. Oh, how I wish you could do that, Karen. Thank you for that. And now let's welcome Karen as she tells us a story entitled My African Safari. Thank you, thank you, Linda. And welcome fellow storytellers. Well, my son surprised me in 2013 with a Mother's Day birthday combination trip to Africa, a safari, a 10 day safari to Tanzania, to the Serengeti National Park. And then we had to, because we were so close, we had to tag on Zanzibar. But first of all, I'll tell you, when we flew in after a 20 hour flight, flew in, we got in in the evening, we went right to our hotel and we crashed. There was no ifs, ands, or buts, we crashed because we had to be up early the next morning because you see, Africa is a little warm in the afternoons. We've had a taste of that this week. Anyway, you start off early because that's when all the animals are all up and all excited. So in we climb into this open air Jeep. It has no top so you can stand up and look over things and the, there's no windows on the side. So we jumped in the vehicle and off we took. Well, it didn't take us very long. We probably maybe got a mile down the road and everybody stopped. Why? Because as I looked next to me, I saw four legs. Didn't see the body, but I saw four legs. The biggest darn giraffe I've ever seen just meanders across the road like it owns it. And they do. Because in Africa, the animals have the right of way. People must wait. 
So we waited for this, about six of the, I'm sure this was the daddy of all, because as I said, we're sitting there and all I can see is his knees as they're crossing in front of us. And not too much further down the road, wait a minute, we've got to stop again. This time it's for a small herd of elephants. And it is true. The mamas and the babies, the babies do hold on their mama's tail as they're walking, <laughs> meandering across the wilderness. And there they did cross the road and we got to watch it was they, our guide thought it was probably the matriarch, her three older daughters and the newest baby as they crossed the road. Of course, the whole thing is in that 10 days is to see the big five. And the big five are the elephants, which we saw right away. The elephants, the lions, the panthers, the rhino, and the hippopotamus. Those are the big five. So I already got one off the list, and we never even made it down into the park yet. So we're getting into the park and traveling around and all of a sudden off to the side, we saw this movement, saw this gazelle running and guess what? A lioness was chasing it, took it down and she dragged it almost right over to the road, right by our cars. We could literally see the lioness eating the, the food. it was it was so exciting i mean you see it on on the travel logs and you never think you see something like that in per, in person then we're driving along and he looks at this tree and he says oh there, there's a panther up in that tree and he said well there's a panther in that tree it looks like a tree we didn't see anything and we have binoculars. Now, my son and I have binoculars. He just has his, his eyes. We said, how do you know there's a panther in that tree? And he said, look, do you see the legs of the wildebeest hanging down? And put up our, wow, you're right. Those are four legs hanging down. He said, somewhere right in that area is the panther. They're the only cats that take their food up in the tree and eat in the air. How exciting. Of course, we didn't really see it. We saw the wildebeest and that, but we did have a chance because our guide knew these two trees in this area were where the panther always goes. So we just came every morning we'd come by <laughs> until we finally got to see the panther. Now we've seen the elephant and the panther and we now, and when you're driving in the Serengeti, what is very strange is you have this wilderness, flat area, arid area, and then all of a sudden you have these tree croppings that look like somebody came and just dropped four or five trees down in the middle of the wilderness. And that's where a lot of the animals live. And then you have rock outcroppings and they truly are igneous rocks where the earth has opened and these big, huge granite rocks have just shot up out of the earth and then it subsided back down again. And that's where the lion prides always are. We've got to see the big daddy with two females and the cubs. I just couldn't believe it. So we were just getting, we were really getting. So then we took a boat trip, actually a canoe trip. And he told us, be careful of the hippos. I will look and let you know. But if we see a hippo, when I say back up, I mean back up. And he was not kidding. Hippos do not like to be bothered. 
But the thing is, is remember, they're under the water. <laughs> so all of a sudden, we're out there rowing and rowing, and all of a sudden, he says, back up, back up. And we're looking, and up came this hippo, I'm not kidding you, about six feet from our canoe, scared the bejesus <laughs> my son and I as we were backing because yes the hippo was going to let us know we're in their territory so we quickly got out of there so the last one we hadn't seen is the rhino and oh boy I mean we're getting down towards the end of our trip and we haven't seen a rhino and all of a sudden he stops in the jeep and he says look over there now, with our binoculars, with his camera at the highest zoom we can get, there we saw this blob with this horn. <laughs> so we could say we actually saw a rhino, not very up close and personal, but we did see a rhino. But the best thing of the trip were the people. And every safari group has a, a tribe of people that they make contact with. So you actually get to meet personally. <clears throat> we got to meet the Maasai. And if you've seen any of the nature scenes, the Maasai are the tall ones that do that dance, you know, where they jump up and they have the jewelry that, well, they did a whole beautiful routine for us. And then they showed us their homes, homes, their huts. I was so amazed of how frugal and yet how extensive their little huts are. They're very good at making space have dual purpose. So the table folds down and at night it folds up and that's where the kids sleep. The fire pit is over in the corner and all the things are all hung up on these mud walls. And in a, I would say in maybe a six by 10 foot space was a home for a family of six. I was just so amazed, but the women there, they make money. The reason how they make money is selling jewelry. And of course I got carried away. So first of all, I got my little, as you, can you see my little zebra earrings? I love my little zebra earrings. And they made a whole bunch of necklaces like this. Now, of course, these, these jewels and, and stones are not, from Africa, but what they do is they trade them and they told us they do their trading in Zanzibar. So they take their jewelry in Zanzibar and then they get beads to make more jewelry. So that's how we really decided we really needed, wanted to go to Zanzibar. So after having this wonderful trip, we're on our last day and he's really been, he, We've seen the cheetahs from a distance, but not really up close and personal. So we're in our last morning and we're out riding in the Jeep and all of a sudden he stops. And here off to the side is a mother and two cubs walking out there in the wilderness. She lays low. And we sat there for two hours and watched. When the gazelles went by, she zipped out. Whoops, she missed the first one. Came back, moved a little closer, a little closer. And the next time the gazelles came back, she zipped out again and snapped one right out. I mean, I instantly just snapped it right out of the herd and brought it back to her two cubs. What a wonderful experience. And he said, she was teaching them how to hunt. 
What a wonderful way to end going in the Serengeti. So off we go that afternoon, fly over, quick little trip over to Zanzibar. Zanzibar, you have to go to the market. Remember I told you about the market? I bought a pair of sandals there. Yeah. I wanted to show you the sandals. You know what these bottoms are made from? They're made from old tires. Now I've had these sandals and I've worn them every summer since 2000 and what did I say? 13, my son took me. And they will, this will wear out before this bottom tire <laughs> ever wear out. They're so comfortable. But then the people there are so funny. They want to sell you. So they're, they want to barter. And I'm not a barter. Who might have kept saying, you're paying too much. Mom. <laughs> They'll come down. I didn't care. I was just so surprised. But in Zanzibar, Zanzibar has been controlled by the Moors, by the English, by the Dutch. And so in their narrow little streets, there's no addresses or anything, but their homes. Can you see this door? This is the doorways. Look at how ornate. Each of the doors are individually carved. And that's how you know your house by your carving on your door. And that's how you know. And something up here on the top tells the, what the family name is. But I bought four of these, but I gave the others away. The people in Zanzibar were so friendly. And this was my last purchase at the market. And what is really neat, it's a square piece of cloth that they've just sewed up the sides, <laughs> sewed up to make an arm. And it's the most comfortable top I've ever had. But my African safari allowed me to see the big five, but especially to meet the Maasai's and the people of the Zanzibar. Thank you. Linda, you're muted. There I am. Can you hear me now? I just wanted to tell Karen that I saw in the big five, I heard the big five of the animals, the geology, the plant life, the, um, the people, the economics, the bartering. It was a beautifully well-told story. So we really got a, a, a beautiful picture of everything you did. Thank you. Now. Our next teller is John Petrick. When John was asked, where would he like to go? I was really touched by his answer and very surprised. John would like to go to Vienna. During the years of 1910 to 1914, he's always been fascinated with the era immediately prior to World War I when faith, science, and reason drove a narrative of inevitable human progress only to see it shattered when the same skills were put to use to kill millions in World War I. And then we ask, who would he like to meet? And he says, well, John said he would like to meet the people who were in Vienna at that time. And I was surprised the people he listed here, Sigmund Freud and even John's grandparents were there and Einstein, Lenin, Stalin, and they would drop by, he said, from time to time. And this is the one that surprised me the most. Even the famous young artist, Adolf Hitler, who studied painting there. Very insightful. Thank you for sharing that, John. And now John is going to tell us a story about a lesson he learned on his own. Let's welcome John. Thank you very much, Linda. I'm gonna take my head here. Um, so, it's better to give than to receive, right? Our moms always told us that. That was kind of hard to buy when you were eight years old and waiting for Christmas. But as we got older, as we aged, 
we sought relationships and we sought love and maybe had some kids of our own, we started to discover the joy of giving, how making other people happy can make you happy. So as I got older, I got better at the giving part, but receiving for me was just really hard. We all know that aunt or neighbor at the birthday party who is just so gracious and makes everybody around her feel so great about their presence. Well, that was never me. Like most American males, I was raised to be strong and independent. Don't ever take anything from anybody. And so my culture never told me, never taught me how to accept, how to receive, whether it be a gift or help or even love. I nearly ruined my relationship with my wife my first birthday when I responded to her presence so unkindly and so, so badly. Luckily, we worked it through and 40 years later, we're still together. Well, with that, with that background, I wanted to take you to a place long ago and far away, uh, to the Czech Republic in March of 2019. I had just completed a two week language course there and I was, uh, I was gonna bike across most of the Czech Republic. Well, on my prior bike trips, I had always gotten in really good shape, but this one was in March and I was still living in North Dakota at the time. So I never had an ability to train. It's always cold and icy and snowy, windy. So I just, I never got in shape. So I was gonna have to wing it. Well, the first day of my bike trip was, it was a disaster. I struggled, my out of shape body struggled to go up and down these mountains that most of the central Czech Republic is small mountain ranges. And my cell phone died, but the worst thing that happened was I used this website called hotels.cz. And I get to my first destination and there's no rooms. So I book another place and I have to get on my bike, take my tired butt another 20 miles down the road and there's no rooms. Mm -hmm. Well, it's getting dark and I eventually get a cab to another town 10 miles off of my road. Well, the next morning my legs would barely move and I was still going uphill. I actually went by two ski resorts. There was snow on the side of the road. There was snow on the road sometimes. But, and I looked at my odometer one time and I saw I was going five miles an hour. And I went, how, how am I ever gonna make my next, 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 next destination, which is like 50 miles away. But, the beautiful thing about mountains is they all have a top and I finally reached it after almost all morning going uphill. And I was able to cruise downhill for several miles and restored my body, restored my spirit. But nonetheless, by the end of the day, after two long days on the bike, I was shot. I was so ready to be done. And so when I saw there was a little shortcut I could take, I took it. Well, that shortcut ended up turning into a one lane dirt track up and down the hills and through the trees. That shortcut cost me at least an additional 45 minutes and totally drained me of all my remaining emotional energy. When I finally got to my destination, I discovered it wasn't even a town. It was instead a series of resorts around a lake. And remember now, it was March. It was the off season. I got to my hotel and guess what? It was closed. Well, I'd seen on the road a sign for food back a few, a few hundred yards. So I went back there and I got off the road and I went up a little street and lo and behold, this 
place that was serving food was actually a hotel. It had five story hotels, a big hotel. Well, I, uh, I tried to open the door and it was locked. And I looked at the sign, winter hour, six o'clock. And I looked at my clock, 602. I pounded on the door. I had to get in there. This guy, nice looking, handsome guy, about 50, graying, came to the door and looked at me. I must have looked as bad as I felt because he cautiously let me in. Well, he didn't speak any English, but we could kind of communicate in my broken check. And I told him I wanted a room. He said, the hotel's closed, just the restaurant's open. I said, I probably begged, <laughs> hey, it's dark out there. I don't have anywhere else to go. His face remained passive. But eventually he called his boss and his boss said he could rent me a room. So he gave me a key and told me to go shower and come back and we'd settle up. Well, I came back to the front desk and he said, 700 kroon which was about $35. So I pulled out my credit card and I gave it to him. He said, no, no, we don't have internet at the hotel during the off season. No credit cards. Well, I only have 300 in cash. Well, there's an ATM in town. Well, how far is town? Eight miles? Nahora, uphill? Yeah. Nemuju to de la trilish unuveni. I can't do that. I'm too tired. Can you just take my 300 now and I'll settle up in the morning? He looked at me soberly and just said, wait. Well, he finished up some work and then he motioned me and we got in his car, the Czech equivalent of a 10 year old Chevy probably. We drove to town, we stopped at the ATM, we stopped at a little store and he got some cigarettes. I wanted to get out and get some food. He said, no, no, there's food at the hotel. I was thinking, I really don't want vending machine food, but I guess I really don't have any choice. Well, I found out his name had been, was Pavel. And when Pavel and I got back to the hotel, I settled up my bill and then he took me into the dining room and set me down at the bar. He served me a beer. He gave me a menu and asked what I wanted. I still didn't know exactly what was going on, but I pointed at something and he left. And 15 minutes later, he comes back with a full hot meal, sets it in front of me. He pours me another beer. I said, he looked at me kind of strange and I realized I just told him he was very skinny. <laughs> Pavel is very kind. The sober guy's gray blue eyes moisted over with tears. I think mine did too. And that's when I learned that maybe I could do this receiving thing after all. That maybe mom was wrong. Maybe sometimes it is better to receive than give. That maybe sometimes that true kindness must be recognized. Thank you. Thank you, John. Beautiful, beautiful, beautifully told story. And my comment is a favorite quote from Mr. Rogers. He says, we are all neighbors. Sometimes we're the givers and sometimes we're the receivers, but we are all neighbors. And I think you discovered that on your trip. Neighbors, clear across the world, who knew? Well told, thank you.
Okay, our next story is going to come from Joyce Ormond. Now, Joyce was the first one to send me a reply to the two questions. The first question, of course, is where would you like to go? And Joyce said she would like to go to a remote island. Now, check out her outfit. I think she's all totally dressed for this response. She'd like to go to a remote island in the Carolina group of the Micronesia Islands, a U.S. territory, because it was her skin diving dream to go to an island of tropical waters and a free form opportunity to teach, only having contact with the outside world maybe just once a month. And then who would she like to meet? Well, she said, she continued with this answer, that she would like to meet the people on that island who spoke little English, would probably come to school on their own time schedule, day and hour didn't mean anything to them. And students would range from senior elders to toddlers just two to three years old. Well, now I think we're gonna hear more about those two answers in her story because she says she's gonna tell us about the time she was a bohemian skin diver of 23 and well, let's hear the rest of the story from, from Joyce. Okay, Joyce, let's hear it. Yep, I was, I was 23. By then I was in just diving. I loved diving. Wait a minute, I have to unmute myself. <laughs> I thought I already did. You're good, you're good. I oh, hear okay. you. I hear you. <laughs> well, it, the sign was still in the middle of the screen. Uh, anyway, I taught school and I dove. Now, my father once told me, when something's hard to get, it's more precious. Well, for me, that really worked out. I don't know how many of you remember, this is 60 years ago or more, Jack Cousteau. I love Jack Cousteau. He inspired me for the marine world, the animals, the underseas. And so I wanted to be a scuba diver. It wasn't easy. It took me a while to become a recognized, bona fide skin and scuba diver. Because back then, a woman who wanted to be a scuba diver was about as welcome as a skunk at a picnic. But I persevered. And from about October to March, I was the first one out the door on Friday afternoon, headed for the coast, camped, dove all day Saturday if weather permitted, all day Sunday. Most of the time I came back Sunday night, got ready to go to school Monday morning. Sometimes I was so tired I waited and I got up at three o'clock in the morning and drove home from the coast and took a shower and went to school. Well, I lived with two roommates in South Sacramento and my one roommate wanted to work for the federal government overseas. So she saw an advertisement and I went with her. And when we got there, it wasn't for Europe or Germany or any of those places. We met a recruiter from Saipan for the trust territories that the United States had in the Micronesian Islands. Well, he had me at his beautiful sand beaches and 200 foot visibility under, I knew boy, oh, I wanted to go there. Now I kind of lost track of what all the details that he was talking about, but I paid attention when he said, now there are, we've been there for quite a while now and we have three levels of assignments. Number one is in Saipan where there is a residential high school and several established elementary schools. Level two is a little bit farther out where English is spoken. School is more or less established. Uh, a boat comes at least once a week. Uh, you get fresh supplies and so forth and you have contact with Saipan. 
Level three is the remotest. This is where we're first going to get a foothold. You need to try to introduce English and try to introduce the culture that there's a bigger world out there and they live by somewhat different rules like clocks and times and calendars. And because they, their world is controlled by the sun and the moon and the waves. And I couldn't think of any place that I wanted to go more. <gasps> the people were Polynesian uh, there had some pictures, they played drums and then, but I did know that if I went there, I would learn all sorts of things. By the time I got back, I'd know all about the ocean. I could swim with the tropical fish. I could explore the coral reefs. I could swim with the stingrays and the dolphins and the great big giant sea turtles. <gasps> My dream come true. So I filled it out, checked level three. I went for the little 15 minute interview and the recruiter said, this all looks very good. Then we got down to the bottom where it said, where you checked one, two or three, or maybe one and two. He said, uh, weren't you listening to me? I said, yes, I think so. He said, you marked level three. You can't go to level three. It's our policy. We don't send single people to level three, especially not women. Oh, so would you like me to wipe this out and I'll put one or two? I said, no, if I can't go to three. I don't want to go. So I went home thinking I had heard the last of that dream. Well, time went on. I, had, I arranged with my principal to only take a half year uh, or half time assignment for teaching next year. And because I was going to go back to college and take the basic courses that I was going to need to switch my career to marine biology. Well, along about April, maybe, maybe it was May, I got a letter from the director of the United States Trust, Trust Territory in Micronesia. I opened it. I thought they, they were nice to send their rejection. And it said, dear Miss Anderson, we are happy to extend to you a job in the Micronesian Islands on the Carolinas and an atoll in the Carolinas on a level three assignment. I was out of my mind. I hadn't told anybody because they told me I didn't have a chance. Now, in some parts of the world, Joyce is a boy's name. Maybe they thought it was a boy. Anyway, I signed it, had it notarized, and boy, that went right back. And I read all the fine print. I got a confirmation back. Oh boy, could I afford the cameras that I wanted? I wanted the best still camera I could get. I wanted the best eight millimeter film camera I could get. I still didn't tell anybody. I thought my principal might be a little bit mad because, well, he'd already helped me get a half time position. But I, so I, I was just too busy. And then I got a call from my father. The family doctor wanted my father and me to come to the office. Well, I went. I knew my mother had been in the hospital, but it was nothing serious. We walked into the doctor's office and he said, Ken, Joyce, Winnie has a brain tumor and lung cancer. We're gonna radiate the brain tumor to make her feel more comfortable so her, because her face is going numb. We can't operate on the lung cancer. She has three to six months to live. 
I didn't even react. I, I was in such a shock. I, I didn't know what to do. And it was 60 years ago. My father's, the doctor said to my father, do you want me to inform Winnie of the diagnosis? And my father said, no, another shock. We went out to the car and I was still numb. We hadn't come together. I was going back to my house and he was going back to our home. And he said, now Joyce, you know what this means. This means that your mother can't go back to work when she gets better. I went home. I didn't cry until I got home. I cried. My roommates cried with me. My one roommate who was an RN said, don't worry, Joyce, he'll come around. He'll, he'll be okay. And I couldn't quite bring myself. And then Marie said, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know what to do. And she said, no, I mean, what are you going to do about going to the Carolinas? Oh, gave me the calendar. We looked at the calendar. July, middle of July through December. That was the window. I can't go. She said, well, what are you going to do? You already signed a contract. So I called and I told him my position. And I said, I don't think it's fair. I'm just going to get there. I, I have to go in the middle of August. That's right when she's going to be the worst. I can't go. And he said, we understand. We'll send you a release. And so they did. And I did take the next year partially off, but I never reapplied to go to the Micronesian Islands. And I've often wondered, oh, I would have loved to seen the people and everything. And my life would have changed. Maybe I wouldn't have come back in two years. Maybe I would still be there. What would have happened to me? I would have been completely different. But you know, in researching this, Micronesia is different now. They have hotels and from luxury down to huts on the beach. And I've made a promise to myself, I am going to try to get in shape, which means I have to learn to swim five miles. And I'm going to try and give me two years and I'm going to go back and I'm going to visit where my life would have made a huge change 60 years ago. Thank you. And you need Thank you. Oh my goodness. That was a surprise ending because I thought you really had gone. What a surprise <laughs> ending. That was great. Thank you. My goodness. And your outfit was perfect. Perfect. You were you were outfitted for the story. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes. Oh, thank you. Now our next teller is Ramya. And Ramya, will you say your last name for me? It is uh Sri Nidhi. Sri Nidhi. Srinidhi. That'll do. <laughs> Close enough. Well, That's okay. Oh, thank you. When Ramya, when she got that question of where would you like to go, she replied, she says, well, that answer to that question always changes with time. And then she went on to say that she would love to travel to the United States, because she lives in India now. And because she would be happy then to be to, able to visit her brother who lives here in the US. And most importantly, she is dreaming of visiting the US to work as a storyteller from India, bringing her rich stories from her culture. And then we, I asked, well, who would you like to meet? And she goes, hmm, I love that question. Hmm. <laughs> and she says, I may want to meet the little prince from the book, The Little Prince by Antoine de Saint-Esprit. Did I do it okay? Saying she may have a few interesting conversations with him. I'll bet you would. And now <laughs> let's, let's, let's have our, our dear Ramya tell us the story of the fearless maiden. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Good evening, uh, everyone. Thank you. Okay, let me jump right in. Uh, <clears throat> so the story that I have for you this evening is a German fairy tale. It's from the Brothers Grimm collection. Uh, it's, it's, there's different names. It's called the Handless Maiden, but I would like to call her the Fearless Maiden. <clears throat> they once lived a miller, a very poor miller. He lived with his wife and a beautiful daughter in the village. The miller used to go to the forest to collect firewood. Just like every day, he left to the forest to pick up some firewood. As he was picking firewood, he heard some ruffle in the leaves. And just then, a very strange looking man walked from behind the tree. <laughs> What good is all the firewood for you, Mila? I can fill your house with gold if you can give me what lies behind your old mill now. <laughs> Said the strange man. The miller thought for a while what was behind his old mill was, was just an apple tree and he could cut it off in exchange for all the gold and all the luxury. He agreed. He made an agreement. He made a deal with the stranger. He shook hands and he said, all right, I will be back to get what is rightfully mine, <laughs> said the strange man. And he left, he left into the dense forest. The miller came back home to find his house filled with gold. And his wife immediately asked him, what, what, what is going on? Why do we have so much gold? When she learned what had happened in the forest, you fool, she said. What, the person that you've met is none other than the evil himself. And what was behind, what was behind our old mill? was none other than our own daughter. She was cleaning the shed behind the mill. The miller was shocked. His wife was scared. But, but there was so much gold in the house. A, a year passed. The strange man did not come. Two years passed. Three years had passed. And there was no sign of the strange man. Until one fatal morning there was a knock at the door the miller the miller opened the door <laughs> i am here to take what is rightfully mine send your daughter with me miller <laughs> said the strange man just then the miller's daughter had finished her bath and she walked in she walked in wearing a beautiful white dress. Ah, oh, she is too clean. I cannot take her. Don't give her any water. I'm going to be back tomorrow. And he left. The girl just, she fell on her knees. She was shocked. She was shattered when she learned what was going on. She cried all night. She cried into her hands all night long. And the next day when the strange man came back, ah, her hands are too clean and I cannot touch her. Cut off her hands, Miller. Cut off both her hands. Otherwise it will be you whom I'm going to take. And he left. A promise is a promise, isn't it? A deal had to be kept. The young girl offered her hands to her father. The miller took an ax, his hands were trembling and in a quick bow, he cut off both her hands. The girl stood there Watching her hands in a pool of blood, she cried. 
She cried into the stumps of her hands, not sure if it was because of the pain of her hands being cut or the pain of betrayal of trust. Well, the next day when the strange man came, the stumps of her hand were so clean that he could not touch her. And he had only three chances to take her. And he just left because he couldn't touch the maiden because she was too clean. Well, the mother went and hugged her and the father said, don't worry, my darling, we have enough luxury gold and we're going to take care of you for the rest of your life. She did not want to stay there even for a minute. She thanked her parents for what they had given her so far. She got her hands tied behind her back and she said, the time has come for me to go. The time has come for me to take that journey myself. Let me see what destiny has in store for me, the places that I can go and the people that I am destined to meet. And she left. She just left into the forest. She walked through the meandering parts of the forest in the dense, dark forest for long she was now feeling hungry and thirsty and without her own hands she could not even feed herself and soon she was in front of a beautiful orchard which was owned by the king of that land there was juicy succulent peaches hanging from those trees and she was so hungry she reached out with her mouth and the tree the tree bent down to allow her to feed herself with this juicy peach. As she quenched the hunger, the king was there who confronted her. She looked into his eyes and he looked into hers. She narrated her story and the king fell in love with this beautiful maiden at that very spot and he asked her if she would marry him he even he even got silver hands replaced for her and she went to the palace and there was a beautiful wedding well that is not the end of my story the king had to go to a war and Within soon, within very little time, the young maiden, the young princess gave birth to a baby boy. The queen mother sent a message to the king who was, who was in a faraway land with a messenger that his wife had delivered a baby boy. The messenger who was going through the forest fell asleep, strangely fell asleep in the middle of the forest and the message was changed. The evil was waiting for a chance and this message was replaced. And what the king read said, your wife had given birth to a monster. Well, the king had sent a message back that take care of my wife until I come back. But strangely, the messenger again fell asleep in the middle of the forest and the message was exchanged again. And what the queen mother read said, kill my wife and my child. The maiden did not want to stay there in that palace even for a second after what she had read. She tied her child close to her chest with a cloth and she left the palace. She left again, just into the wilderness, into her own journey. She walked, but now she had, she had her child to take care of. After a long journey, she came, she came into what looked like a hut and everyone, lives here with joy and happiness was written on that hut. She knocked on the door and a very kind woman 
opened the door. She welcomed the maiden and the child. Well, as, as she was taking care, nursing her child, as she was seeing her son grow, maybe, maybe it was the power of motherhood. She healed. She healed and she regrew her own hands back again. The joy of raising her son. As for the king, as for the king who came back from war and was eagerly waiting to meet his wife, wondering what had happened, why she had delivered to a monster and all that, the queen mother who was really hurt by that message shared it with the king. Well, he immediately knew it was the work of the evil and he he had to go. He had to leave the palace and go and look for his wife and his son. And he set out. For seven years, the king wandered without food and water, looking for his wife and his son. He looked for them everywhere. And finally, he too came to a hut which said, Everybody lives, lives here with joy and happiness. He was tired. He was tired with his journey and he just sat there at the door. The kind woman was none other than the fairy godmother herself. She recognized the king. She united the king with his wife and his son. He was shocked, joyed, rejoiced to see that his wife had regrown her hands. He was so delighted to see his son. They embraced and they wept for hours. The king took his wife and his son back to the palace and another, another wedding was arranged between the king and his lovely maiden. And maybe it was celebrating the rebirth of the king, of the, his wife, and his lovely son. Thank you. Thank you. Beautifully told. Rama, your stories are like tapestry to me. There's texture, there's voices, there's emotion, there's pacing, and altogether a beautiful piece. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. I enjoyed sharing this story with all of you. Thank you so much. Okay, so now, our next teller is Mark Berry. He calls me Linderella. I like, I like Mark, we're old friends. So I ask Mark, where would you like to go? And he gives me an answer that makes me want to go like this. Is that right? Can I do that? He says he would like to go to Vulcan to see the moons. <laughs> and because Vulcans are so logical in their thinking that it'd be fun exploring ideas with them. And then who would he like to meet? Well, Mark says he would like to meet Marcus Aurelius, the Roman philosopher and the last good emperor who was in the year 175 and to see if he is worthy of me, me being Mark, using his first name as his nickname. He loves his writings. And then Mark would say, well, while I'm also there meeting Marcus Aurelius, I'd like to meet his 12 children if he really had that many. And while I'm there, I may as well see his home. Okay, Mark, that is a great um, whimsical and fun answer to the questions. And you are gonna tell us a story now about a grandma in Idaho? The best grandma ever. Thank the you, Linda Rella, for ever. that lovely introduction. Another place I'd like to go is back to Lewiston, Idaho. And another person I'd like to see is my beloved departed grandmother. Uh, some of you have heard part of this story before, but I put some more elements together to try and make this a story worth sharing with an audience. And if anybody has any tips for me, if you have any uh, suggestions or uh, constructive criticism, I would love to hear those. My grandmother visited us where my mother took my dad to live in San Francisco, California, of all places. 
both of my parents, kin, all of their families lived in this little town of Lewiston, Idaho, a town very much like where I live now, Auburn, California. It too lives on the confluence of two rivers. And the two towns all my life have had the same population, the same rate of growth, very similar. Well, when grandma came to visit us one time, she got a sliver and it was not just a little sliver. This thing was more than a toothpick size. I was about eight years old, maybe first or second grade. And my grandmother and I had this very special relationship all my long eight-year-old life. We had been best friends. We could tease each other. We could laugh at each other. We didn't have to guard our words or weigh our thoughts with each other. We were just unconditional love both ways. And so when she got this sliver, my parents, both my parents offered to re remove it, extract it from her finger. And she said, no, I'll have Mark do it because I know Mark would never hurt me. Well, at eight years old, trying to keep track of her finger and the sliver and the magnifying glass and the tweezers, I know my mortar skills were not near what my parents would be. And I know I didn't do as fine a job as my parents would do. But because of this unconditional love relationship between my grandmother and I, she felt no pain. And I finally got the thing out of her finger. Fast forward to college. I went up to Lewiston, Idaho to attend college. Uh, I think it was my second year of college because all my kinfolk lived there and I wanted to see, I don't know, maybe I want to stay in the Bay Area in California or maybe I'd rather change my life and uh, live the way all of my ancestors did. So I was there going to college and had a part-time job and typical young college kid, you know, just barely trying to keep it together, just barely trying to keep a car running and barely trying to make ends meet and all that wonderful stuff and meeting new people and uh, enjoying a new culture. Very different from San Francisco up in the farming community of northern Idaho. And by that time, my, my grandma had been put in a nursing home and it was not a nice one. There was urine smell. It was not, they were four to a room. It was just not a nice place. Nothing I could do about that, but I could visit her. So every Saturday when I had a little time off of work and school, I would visit her and I would say, Ma, as I called her, I'd say, Ma, let's, let's go out. Let's, um, let me take you to lunch. Let me get you out of this place. Uh, my car's not much, but it'll get us there. And she wanted the same thing every Saturday. She wanted what she called a plain hamburger. She wanted a patty of meat and two buns and that's it. No condiments, no vegetables, what she called a plain hamburger. I said, Grandma, come on, let me take you to a nice place and have a nice meal. Nope, she wouldn't have anything to do with anything else. She always wanted, she looked forward to her plain hamburger. So we did that. It was our little tradition and we both loved it. Well, as we had our visits on these Saturdays, I talked about what any young working college single lad would talk about. I talked about the difficulties of keeping the car running and finding a retread tire when I needed one or I talk about the difficulties of the studies and getting good grades and working with the professors and the homework and all of those challenges, the challenges of having a job and getting along with the boss and, you know, trying to do well enough to keep that job. And the challenges of the opposite sex, you know, when you're a young college age person, you do have some focus on that uh, area. And I was not really good at it. <laughs> I, didn't have a, I didn't have a wife or a steady girlfriend or anything like that. So I would talk to her about those trials and tribulations in the dating world as well. Now, grandma had a fun little thing that she would do. Every time we would finish one of our visits, she'd tear off a scratch of paper from a corner of a magazine page or corner of a piece of scrap paper or something. She would write down a Bible uh, verse. She'd write down the chapter and verse of a Bible quote and stuff it in my shirt pocket. And when I went home, I would get out the Bible and look it up. 
And do you know that every single time she did that, that Bible verse spoke to me and spoke to what I was concerned about, gave me help, gave me comfort every single time. This woman knew her Bible. Every Sunday all her life, she went to that Christian church close to her home. And that was just one of the many, many things that I loved and adored about Ma Berry. She passed away in, in the time, as people do, and we all attended her funeral. Now, she had five children, and each of them had two or three kids, except for my folks. I was an only child. So I had a bunch. I had at least a dozen cousins that were about my age. And after the funeral, the memorial service, when you go into the reception area, there's different tables. And all of our parents, siblings, and their age group, they went over there to those tables. And all of us cousins, uh, our, my peers, we all went over here to our table. And as we were there and trying to comfort each other and commiserate with our loss and everything, my younger cousin, Kathy, just couldn't hold it together. She was just so distraught at losing Ma Berry that she was in tears and we couldn't seem to comfort her. And we all we could do was love her through her pain. And through the tears and the sobs, she accidentally let it slip out that, and I know I was her favorite. And when cousin Connie said she knew she was her favorite, my eyes looked up and looked all around that table of cousins and their eyes were looking up and looking around at me. And finally, we compared notes and we found out that Grandma Barry had each of her grandchildren convinced that they were her favorite grandchild of all. And it wouldn't be nice to share this information with your cousins, of course, that wouldn't be kind. What a woman this woman was, what a parent, what a grandparent. All I can say now that I'm a great grandparent is I'm trying my level best to do as my grandma taught me. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. That's a beautifully told story. Very, very heartfelt. And for those of us who are grandparents, we need to always remember that each one of those little grandkids are, yep, they're, each one's our favorite. Thank you Absolutely. for sharing that. Yeah. yeah. My <laughs> grandkids you. are 27 and 32. I mean, 37, 20, ugh, 27 and 31. And um, yeah, I'm sure they think I'm their favorite too. Yeah. Or, or yeah, it's just favorite. about the age of mine. And they both know that <laughs> they are my favorite. Yes. Well, finally, we're to our last teller, our featured teller for the evening, Denise McCormick. She hails from the Garden State of New Jersey. Denise is the president of the guild. I love the name of this guild, Patchwork, a storytelling guild, very creative. She's also the state liaison New Jersey to the National Storytelling Network. She's gonna tell us more about herself after she tells her story. But first I wanna share her answers to the two questions. Denise, where would you like to go? She says she'd like to participate in a gathering of women, women doing something like washing at the river or shucking peas or stirring sap over a fire and talking and sharing. She'd like to hear their stories of their lives as they share them and talk about them and plan and help and laugh together the way that they used to do when people were closer together, living further apart, and not alienated by the rise of industrialism when word held more weight than contract. And so who would she like to meet? Well, she'd like to meet Leonardo da Vinci because he was so incredibly creative in all disciplines, art, architecture, mathematics, science, religion. He was a Renaissance man bridging the time and representing the medieval and Renaissance periods, but was limited in his pursuits due to his rank or politics of the time. Denise said she would be interested to hear his perspectives on humanity and its many folds. Well, help me welcome Denise. She's going to tell us a story and then we'll have a few minutes for us to, for us, her to tell us about what's happening with Patchwork, a storytelling guild. Thank you. Welcome, Denise. 
Hi, thank you everybody. I'm going to share with you, hi, I've loved listening to all of your stories. I'm going to share with you a literary tale. It has been adapted by me and reworked somewhat, but it is a story that um, I fell in love with. It was written by Kate Chopin, who was considered a pre-feminist author because feminism had not yet started. And this story is called A Pair of Silk Stockings. Little Mrs. Summers one day found herself the unexpected owner of $15. Seemed to her a large sum of money. The way it filled up her money bag gave her a sense of importance that she had not enjoyed for years. The question of investment was one she considered carefully. For a day or two, she walked about the house, her head in the clouds, contemplating her choices. She did not wish to act hastily and do anything she might regret. At night, she lay awake, staring up at the plaster of the ceiling, her mind racing as one idea chased away another. Adding a dollar or two more would have Janie's shoes last longer than they customarily did, and new, buying new cloth for new shirts for the boys. And each of the girls should have new dresses, caps for the boys, sailor hats for the girls, and still there'd be enough left over for new stockings, two pair per child. Oh, the, the time that would save her in mending the old stockings. The idea, the idea of seeing her little family looking all fresh and new for once in their lives made her restless with excitement. Sometimes, Sometimes the neighbor folks would speak of Mrs. Summers' better days before she even thought of being a Mrs. Summers. She herself never indulged in such revelry. She had no time for the past. The needs of the present took up all her energy. She knew the value of finding items at a reduced cost. She could stand in line for hours waiting, moving little by little to that necessary bargain. She could push her way in if need be. But that day, that day she was feeling tired and a bit weak. Between getting the children fed and cleaning the house and preparing to go shopping, why, she hadn't even eaten anything. When she arrived at the large department store, she sat in front of an empty counter trying to gather up the strength and the courage to push through a mess of busy shoppers. She put her hand down. She wore no glove and became aware of something pleasant to the touch. She looked down and saw a pile of silk stockings. The sign nearby announced that they had been reduced in price. A young girl, the saleswoman, asked her if she'd like to examine the silky leg coverings. Mrs. Summers smiled as if she'd been invited to inspect diamond jewelry with the aim of purchasing it. With both hands now, she held the stockings up to the window to see the light shine through. One dollar and 98 cents. She said it aloud. And then, do you think, do you think there are any size eights and a halves among these? There were many. She chose for herself a black pair, then handed the girl a $5 bill and weighed it for the wrapped box with the stockings in it. The box was so small, it 
seemed lost in that worn out old shopping bag. Then she went to the elevators, to the upper floor where the women's rest area was. She found a chair there, sat down, peeled off the old stockings and replaced them with the new. It seemed as if for the very first time she was taking a rest from the tiring act of thought. As if she allowed herself to be controlled by some machine-like force that moved and directed her actions and released her from all responsibility. How good was the touch of raw silk against her skin? She just wanted to lie back and enjoy the richness of it all. She did for a while. Then she put on her shoes, tossed the old stockings into the bag, and went to the shoe department to wait to be fitted. The young salesman there could hardly reconcile the beautiful new stockings with the battered, beaten old shoes. She told the salesman she wanted an excellent and stylish fit and she did not mind paying more as long as she got what she desired. She chose a pair of shiny black boots, pulled back her skirts, turning her toes one way and her head another. Her foot and ankle looked so lovely she could hardly believe they were a part of herself. Then she went to the glove department. She put her arm up there on the counter and a young saleswoman drew a kid glove onto her hand, smoothing it over her wrist and buttoned it up neatly. Ordinarily, the bargains that Mrs. Summers wore were so cheaply made, it would have been unreasonable to expect them to be fitted. But now, here these two women stood head to head, exchanging tiny compliments and admiring the small gloved hand. She thought of where else money might be spent and remembered a shop she had passed on the way in. It was a shop that sold books and magazines. She bought for herself two magazines there the kind she used to read when she could enjoy such pleasant things. And as she walked from that shop with her packages tucked under her arm, a thought struck her, a feeling really. She was hungry. Ordinarily, such a notion would be tucked down real deep until she returned home, but not that day. Not that day, no. That day, like a flash of lightning, she remembered the restaurant just up the corner whose window she'd looked through countless times, admiring the white linen tablecloths and the sparkling glassware. She went there, but when she reached the threshold, she hesitated for just a moment, afraid that the Diners inside would look at her, knowing that she did not belong. But when she entered there, no one raised an eye. And she was seated at a fine table by the window. The tablecloths were even whiter than she imagined. And the crystal glassware cast off prismatic rainbows that spilled over the table and splashed up onto the wall and onto the backs of the chairs of the other diners. And the waiter, oh, the waiter, he spoke to her as if she were a princess of royal blood. She ordered for herself 
six oysters, a chop, something sweet, creme brulee, a glass of wine, and a cup of coffee. And she savored each and every bite as she savored the words in her magazine. The next treat to present itself came in the form of a theater advertisement. She went there, crossing the street, holding her skirts up as high as she dare. Her new stockings and boots and gloves did much for her appearance, and she carried herself straighter and taller and with the satisfaction of knowing that she belonged with the well-dressed crowd. When she reached the theater, the sights, the sounds, the colors washed over her in one glorious sensation. There were women there who went to the theater just to show off their fashionable new attire. There were others who just went to see the show, but Mrs. Summers, oh, Mrs. Summers, she sat with those ladies and she laughed and she cried at that spectacle up on that stage and nobody, nobody could have appreciated it all more than Mrs. Summers. There was one woman sitting next to her, dabbing at her eye with a square of lace who handed her a box of chocolates. When the performance was ended, the theater goers pushed through the heavy wooden doors, some spilling onto the sidewalks, others into the street, each going his or her own way. Mrs. Summer, she went to the cable car and found herself seated there opposite a man who tried to puzzle out the expression on her face. But he would have had to have been a wizard, a magician, a magic man to know that what Mrs. Summers wished for with all of her heart and to the very depths of her soul was that the car should never stop and go on and on and on. Oh boy. Done. Wow. I, I was lost somewhere because I didn't know if I was in a dream or or just being in the presence of somebody who was in a dream herself. Beautifully told. I'd like to hear that again. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, you. Really. Thank you for letting me dust it off a little bit. <laughs> uh, no, wonderful. Um, we have just a very, very couple of minutes left. It's been a long night, but can you tell us a little bit about what your guild is doing? Does it have community outreach? What is happening there? Oh, um, I have a couple of things going on. I am, well, I am the president of Patchwork and we've been doing a lot of virtual things since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh -huh. As a matter of fact, last March, not this past one, but originally with um, everything beginning to shut down, our world, um, our world storytelling day was canceled at the library where we typically had it. And I bumped that onto, um, to face or, um, yeah, Facebook. So we immediately went virtual last, um, okay. last March and we've been doing a lot of pre-recorded programs for celebrations and we just did world laughter day although world laughter day was kind of a hybrid it was part um it was um pre-recorded beginning middle and end but the storytelling was was all live going in there so that was interesting uh, one of the other things that i've been doing since november 
is producing the children's storytelling series. Well, actually, now it's the family storytelling series for the Lehigh Valley Storytelling Guild. I'm on the board, and because I do video and other techie kind of things, I've been putting together those shows, and tomorrow is our season finale of the family series, which is going to feature each of the storytellers who have been showcased the last six months. So I'm just actually right now waiting for it to finish loading up so I can embed it where it needs to go. But um, you're all welcome to come to that, and I'd love it if you did. It's on the Lehigh Valley Storytelling Guild. Well, look, okay. Um, and where, I, I can't find you. Well, thank you very much. I, uh, Andy, are we out of time? Oh, no, we have time. Are we, we good? We can okay. Stay talk. I, I'm so impressed. I mean, yeah. you, you're just like incredibly busy with your storytelling and things. It's, you yeah, do, do this you have any, time. Do you have some questions for Denise? Yes, I have a question, Denise. Um, how can I tune in to your uh, Zoom presentations? Is there a oh, website? Okay. Can you yeah. can you email me things? I or perhaps can. put it in the chat. Put it in the and, chat, and we can and save the chat. I can also send them. Um, one is well, patchwork is patchworkstorytelling.org. And Lehigh Valley is LV Storytelling. Dot, whoops, I think I spelt it wrong. Storytelling.org. And the, the latter is tomorrow. And I ask people to register for it, but I have it embedded right on the website because we like people to look around. Both guilds, Patchwork has a monthly story swap, which is very informal. Um, I usually record it, and then if there are good stories that people want to keep, I'll splice up and give people their own story that they've done so that it can be posted, you know, on websites or wherever the case may be. And um, that is generally the fourth Thursday of the month. So our next story swap is at 7 p.m. on, I think, June 24th which would be your 4 p.m. Mm -hmm. And you're welcome to come. I ask if people, when they're registering, which is to get the Zoom link for where to go, to let me know um, yes, no, or maybe about telling a story. I have never had a swap where everyone who wanted to tell didn't have the opportunity to do it. It just works out that way. We get like 30 who don't want to, 30% that are maybe and 30% that are yeses. And it just, it just works out, even if I put people on the spot sometimes. And once, you know, once someone starts telling, then it makes everybody more relaxed to tell. And it's anything. It could be playing, you know, a harp if you want to. I don't care. You, if you have something that is, that is worthwhile to you, that you are generous enough to wish to share, then that's absolutely fine. Oh, um, sounds good. Sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> yes, thank yeah. you. I try to say no reading. I've actually never had to say no reading, but I have had a couple of writers come just because they want to hear the words, you know, how they uh -huh. sound aloud. So that's also something that's very nice. And they try. They try not to not to look at what they're doing. But we all know that storytelling follows the writing process. It's in that part of brainstorming and revise, revise, revise. You don't get the finished version until it comes out of your mouth. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> and it's like a surprise yeah. sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Never say, tell it the same way twice. Right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's but, wonderful. Um, yeah, we've had, we actually have grown, particularly patchwork since the pandemic. So we've got, I'm a member of the, um, <laughs> the, the um, California storytellers, and we've got members of California who are members of Patchwork now, so a little bit here and there because this is how we meet. It's like right next door. That's and fantastic. People from Australia and, and India and different parts oh, yeah. of the world tune in too. <laughs> yeah, it's really, it's wonderful. It really, yeah. really is. So. I appreciate being asked to do this. I, I, I'm 
Well, we're so we're so glad that you got to do it for us. Our next swap Thank is you. on June twenty. I mean, July twenty fourth, and we are going to try to do it live, but we're also going to have Zoom at the same time. So we'll have people. Ramil, you'll be able to come from India, and and you'll be able to come, Denise, from New Jersey if you want to. And you're having in person. We're going to do it in person on July twenty fourth. Yeah. Well, I believe so. We still have to vote on it, but I'm I'm pretty sure we're going to. We'll vote at the end of the month. But we're also doing virtual Zoom, oh, right? But we're also doing virtual, yes. We'll, we'll have it Zoom as well. That's Is wonderful. That I hope to join you again, and, and I'd love to tell with you again. This has oh, been that'd be wonderful. awesome. We'd love to have you come back. Fabulous. Um, thank you. Um, oh, gosh, I was just going to say something. I don't know what it was. I hate when that happens. I hate when that happens. <laughs> <laughs> that was me all the time. <laughs> I enjoyed all of your stories. I, I'm surprised how many personal stories were told. But, and I think I mentioned, I try not to go on chat because I can't listen and talk and type at the same time. But your stories all were inspiring and had me recall to mind my own experiences. So, so your stories did exactly what it is that good stories are supposed to do. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, and yours was amazing. It was great. I, I really, you had me, you, yeah, I was, I was, I was paying attention the whole time. So, like, <laughs> as you that? should. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Well, I very good. good. Yeah. Andy, do we have a host next month or a theme? Uh, Andy. I don't have a theme yet. Um, I'm the host. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, we don't have a theme yet because I, I kind of wanted to wait till our board meeting to make sure we were going to do it. And our board meeting got delayed this month, so we're having it next week. Um, and then I'll, I'll, we'll send out a notice about what the theme is and a call for uh, tellers as well. Okay. And I'd like to thank everybody. Today was my first time to be a host, MC person. And, wonderful job. Um, wonderful job. And I, I just appreciate everybody showing up on time and thank you for making it easy for me. Thank Does you. Does everyone know Linda just had her birthday? Yeah. I did just have a birthday. The Happy big birthday. 8 0. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Congratulations. That's great. It I had seven I had ten years to learn how to behave like a septuagenarian and didn't make it. So don't have any great hopes for the octogenarian behavior. <laughs> It ain't well, gonna happen. You can, you can just start looking forward to the nonagenarian then. There you go. Me too. <laughs> Boy, I can relate. I'm a septuagenarian and a bachelor. So I keep saying, bear with me, people. I'm trying to do this without adult supervision. <laughs> well done, Marcus. Marcus Aurelius. Yes. And I have a, I have a quote that I want to share. It's from a, an author that I don't know, Mo Willems, but I love the quote. It says, if you ever find yourself in the wrong story, leave. <laughs> yeah. Good one. And I think we all found ourselves in great stories tonight and I didn't want to go nowhere. Yeah, I wish I could have met Mama Barry or Grandma oh, yeah. Barry. Yes. <laughs> and one thing I you heard in the in the comments was people kept saying that that story reminds me of my favorite grandparent <clears throat> or my favorite aunt or my favorite person. And I'm so glad because it's a very personal story to me. And I'm so glad it has that effect on the listener. I didn't think of that earlier. So thank you guys uh, for your feedback. Yeah, I'm running out of grandchildren. I have to start on my great grandchildren now. You know, <laughs> you got to move on. <laughs> Joyce, related to your story, uh, there's one in my book called Love on a Train, that had I taken that path, my life <laughs> would be completely different. No regrets, but still, you know, it's just one of those things. My son thinks that I'm absolutely crazy. I told him, I have a new goal. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be in shape in two years to take a trip to the Carolinas. And he said, oh, mom, you just can't do that. I'm not Yes, you can. I can. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. It's beautiful now. I, I mean, you know, then I guess it was pretty, you know, remote. But there's nice hotels and nice resorts. I'm going. Don't yes. say can't to Joyce. That, yeah. That's a yeah, that's, that's a dare. She's got to do it. Inspiring. 
This is starting to sound <laughs> like a storyteller's field trip. I have, I have to get it. I have to go before 85. I don't think I can do it past 85. <laughs> Very good. Thank well, you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Linda, I love those questions. It really made me think where I want to go, whom I want to meet. <laughs> well, it was a different type of introduction. And thank you all for, for bringing me great, fun, insightful, historic answers. I loved it. Thank you. I don't like much about the pandemic, but I am grateful today that I got to meet you, Denise and Ramya. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful to meet you this way. Likewise, it's, this has just been wonderful. This has just been wonderful. And I forgot it was Father's Day tomorrow. Yeah, so it is, I yeah. appreciate the reminder. My, my, uh, I'm, I'm the, par the parents for my kids and my youngest son used to get me Father's Day cards. Nice. Every year. So, yeah. And then he stopped. I don't know what the deal is with that, but then he stopped. <laughs> Oh, God. Wow, thanks for reminding me. I'm going to send a Father's Day card to my grandson. <laughs> it works both ways. That'll do it. Yeah. 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 It'll be fun. Okay. All righty. I'll see everybody. I'll see the Bye. board next, next week. Saturday, guys. The board meeting. Bye, Bye. everybody. So Bye, long. Everybody. I have to go feed my goats. <laughs> Okay. Happy. Well, I've heard that excuse all the time. <laughs> all the tellers. Really appreciate it. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night, Good night. 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 Good night.